So all it's uh, my great privilege and honor to uh, introduce Professor Pulkit Agarwal from MIT. Pulkit, as you guys all probably already know by now, is one of the leading stars in robotics in the world today. And uh, his work on uh, robots which learn how to do their things, curiosity-driven learning and so on, is basically uh, some of the most exciting stuff out there right now today. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Pulkit. Pulkit, all yours. Great. Thank you, Bhiksha, for having me and thanks for inviting and everyone, we can make this not a monologue, but we can make this interactive. So, you know, feel free to interrupt me. You know, unfortunately, I won't be able to monitor the chat, but if you just unmute yourself and ask a question, you know, that works great. So let me, you know, share my screen and we can get started. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. Great. So, <clears throat> So the goal that my lab and many people in robotics have been pursuing is what can be best described as physical intelligence, by which I mean a system that can perform any manipulation or locomotion task a human can perform. So if we look at this journey, you know, today we have systems which work very well in highly structured settings. You know, on the left, I'm showing you, you know, some system which can move around in warehouses. On the right, you are in seeing these robots in a factory where they get the same part over and over again so they can repeat the same motion to weld this part or you know perform different operations. So there is no need for adaptation in these scenarios. Right. And the challenge right now in the field is really to move towards less structured settings. Now, what do I mean by less structured settings is the open world assumption where the environment may be unknown, the objects you're encountering, you know, might be unknown, or they might exist in new configurations that you have not seen before, which is typically what in deep learning or machine learning you would call as generalization. So, you know, so how to design these complex, you know, behaviors for these complex tasks in less structured settings. Now we have done this successfully as a field in you know, computer vision, in language and in speech. And the philosophy over there has been to collect large amounts of data and perhaps train a model which can learn from that data. So if we take these you know, latest and greatest advances which have happened in natural language and in computer vision, you know, one could ask the question, you know, how well would robots end up working? Right, and is there something we could borrow from this philosophy to build, you know, robotic systems? So, you know, let me show you an example that uh, Google put out last year. This paper is called SayCan, and they used the latest and greatest language model at the time, and they were communicating with the robot in natural language. And the question was, I spilled, or the instruction was, I spilled my coke on the table. How would you throw it away? and bring me something to help clean, right? And the robot is using a language model similar to GPT to respond to it and perform actions. So let's see what ends up happening over here. And so robot says, you know, I would find a Coke can. It goes, you know, finds a Coke can. And then it says, I'm going to pick it up and then move towards a trash can. And then you would hope it's going to throw it in the trash can. <laughs> You know, but it fails to put it in the trash can. Then it finds a sponge and then it would go back to the spill after picking up the sponge. 
So what you're seeing is this evidence that this robotic system has access to cultural knowledge. It knows I need a sponge or sponge cleans a spill, right? But now let's see what happens. Right? A person still needs to complete the task, right? So the robot knows it needs where the Coke can needs to go in the trash can, where the sponge might be, that it needs to get a sponge to clean the spill, the kind of cultural common sense knowledge that we have in human societies, you know, thanks to these large models. But what it is failing is at this low level execution of these actions, you know, which remains a formidable challenge. So one question you can ask is, you know, can we, you know, just collect uh, and build a large vision language action model in robotics? But the problem we run into is that unlike language and images, which is there on the internet, this data simply, you know, doesn't exist. So it's not, you know, straightforward, you know, how you would, you know, even end up making this model. Right. Now, many of you, you know, might have seen these videos of, you know, robots doing impressive things, you know, for example, on the left doing parkour, or on the right, you know, this robot doing backflips, you know, extremely impressive systems. But the challenge over here is it takes, you know, teams of people, you know, maybe six or 10 people and time, maybe, you know, six months to a year to doctor or to create one of these behaviors. And these systems, you know, perhaps if, they, if we put them in more general scenarios, they're also going to fail. So because of this reliance on, you know, large number of people and time to come up with behavior, we cannot really generate, you know, large number of behaviors or large amounts of data uh, to even get close to training, uh, you know, a large model if that's the path that we want to investigate. Everyone with me so far? Yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. So the goal of this talk is going to be to investigate how we can quickly and easily, you know, design diverse and complex behaviors that work in less structured settings. And I'm going to, you know, begin this investigation by considering manipulation, right? So in manipulation, what we can do really well is picking up objects. You know, for example, over here, this robot can go to this pile and pick up arbitrary objects. And this is, you know, success in grasping has what has fueled, you know, many companies in the logistics and warehouse space where items come in and these companies are able to sort them into piles or pack them into boxes. And those boxes then get shipped when you place an order on Amazon. Right. So one thing that you would notice, you know, in these grasping videos is there's no relative motion between the finger and objects. You know, once you pick up an object, the object has no motion with respect to your hand. Now contrast this with the kind of tasks, you know, shown over here, which is going beyond what you would do after picking up an object, right? So on the left, you are seeing, you know, a man peeling a cucumber, on the right, you know, putting screws, and, you know, on the bottom, you're seeing someone inspecting laptops, right? But the thing to note, in all of these videos is there is motion happening between the object and the finger. And this is a key characteristic of, you know, these tasks. And this is required for a lot of tool use that we want to do. So in a nutshell, you know, today we know how to pick up objects in un or less structured settings. But what we don't know is, you know, then how to use these objects or how to use tools to do the kind of things that I'm showing you over here. So what makes this problem challenging? You know, let's investigate that, you know, for a moment. So suppose I have the object in the current state I'm denoting by ST. This might mean the object pose, the object location, you know, joints of the fingers. And I want to go to the goal state, you know, represented in a different pose, right? So I want to reorient the object, which we saw as a critical part of many of these tool use videos on the previous slide. Now, typically, one has access to physics. Now, what is physics? Physics says that given my current state and my action, what is going to happen next? And then you can pose an optimization problem where you say, I want 
to find a sequence of actions so that after t time steps, I get close to my goal state. And of course, we want to perform this optimization subject to the constraints of physics. Now, many people have attempted this and there have been, you know, very nice demos. For example, here's a demo from a Japanese lab, you know, way back in late 90s, early 2000s. And again, what you will notice in this video is that these fingers are making and breaking contact with the object. So this frequent making and breaking of contact means that we are essentially solving a continuous discrete optimization problem. So if you do optimization, you know, this means, you know, these problems are really NP hard problems, right? Which means that finding solutions in real time or even finding good solutions could be hard. And this is really the main challenge that we run into, you know, when we are trying to design controllers for doing manipulation, which is which goes beyond grasping. Okay. So to solve this problem, what people end up doing is to make simplifications, which ensure that the problem can be solved, but in a narrower range. Right? So for example, one could simplify and say, I'm only going to deal with convex objects. Right? Or we are going to deal with scenarios where the object is only going to move with a small rotation. Or perhaps we're going to restrict the finger motion. Right? And within these restrictions, it becomes easier to do optimization, but then you lose generality. Right? And then there's a human who needs to come in and make these simplifications on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is why it requires, you know, teams of people and, you know, large amounts of, you know, time to design a controller which might work in scenario one, scenario two, or scenario three, but not something which would work, you know, across scenarios. Everyone with me? Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? No. Not yet. Not yet. Perfect. So, you know, consequently, you know, if we look at, you know, many of the in-hand reorientation systems which exist, they only work with few objects, you know, there's no notion of generalization. And in many of these images, what you are seeing is that the object is on top of the hand, right? Now, these scenarios, you know, can be simpler than the real world case, because if the object is on the hand, then the, the hand, you know, doesn't need to fight gravity, right? The object is intrinsically in a stable situation compared to a different situation where you're holding the object, you know, within, you know, from the top. Now, over here, if you make even a single mistake or a couple of mistakes, the object is going to fall down because the object is intrinsically in an unstable configuration uh, in this scenario. And so now think about using tools, for example, using a knife or to cut vegetables or to use a screwdriver, you're almost always holding these tools from the top. So we really want uh, to solve the problem where the hand can hold the object from the top. And despite there being forces from gravity, we are able to perform manipulation. So in 2017, you know, OpenAI had attempted uh, doing this problem of reorienting the Rubik's Cube. You know, this is one of the examples I had on the previous slides. You know, and if you, so first they were only orienting the cube, right? And if you were to look at the system that they constructed, this is how the system looked like. You know, it had, you know, more than 20 cameras looking at the hand over here. So it showed, you know, some promise of, you know, potentially using, you know, machine learning techniques to solve this problem of reorientation, but in a way that cannot be deployed and perhaps only on one object. So what we made our goal was to say, could we construct a general, you know, reorientation system really as a way to move towards tool use. And what our desiderata is that we want to work with complex shapes. We want to generalize to new objects and we really want to system to work in a way that is deployable. So what you see over here is a single camera, you know, looking at this four finger hand, manipulating this object. 
the setup on the right is open source. You know, it costs less than $5,000. If you want, you can get it in your lab and play around with it. And this work was led by Tao Chen. So the philosophy we are going to be using to address this problem is to train in simulation and then transfer things in reality. And the motivation for this is that in simulation, we can emulate many, many diverse scenarios, you know, for example, different object shapes, you know, different dynamics and collect you know, very large amounts of data to deal with this diversity. So in the end, we could have a single controller which could deal with you know, different object shapes, you know, being able to rotate the object to any orientation instead of making simplifying assumptions that I talked about in the previous slide. And the main challenge really is going to be, you know, because simulators may not model the real world accurately, do the controllers trained in simulation actually transfer to reality? So, you know, how about we, you know, how about we do this? Right. Now, before I jump into this, I'll again take a pause and see if someone has a question so far. So do you have any constraints on the shape of the object at this point? At this point, no constraint. And it's assumed rigid. It's assumed to be rigid. Yes, yes. Not No constraint on the object shape. It's assumed to be rigid, but I would say pseudo rigid in the sense that if it deforms a little bit, it's going to be okay. For example, a paper cup, but it should not deform like a cloth. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's you know proceed and see where we can get in this journey. So you know if I want to deploy a controller in the real world, right? What does a controller mean? A controller means something which will consume observations. Observations might be a point cloud that you are capturing from a depth camera. It could be the joint positions of your fingers, and we provide a goal pose which is in what orientation we want the object to be. Now, given these observations, the target is to train a policy. A policy is a function which maps observations into actions. And you know, one way to train these policies is to provide them with rewards. Now, these rewards might say that the reward is high if the object is closer to the goalpost and it is low if the object is far away. And you know one technique that we can use to train these policies is you know reinforcement learning. Now the good news is that if we can train this policy, you know we can potentially deploy it even in reality, right? So when when I mean training, I mean training in simulation, and when I say deployment, I mean deploying it in the real world. Now, because this policy will work on an observation space, which is being captured by sensors in the real world, I, mean, I can measure point clouds, I can measure joint positions, and I know what my goal is. So all of these things are known, and therefore it is easy to deploy this in the real world. But what we find is that these policies are very hard to train. And the reason this becomes hard to train is because the observation space is quite large. And the second thing is even doing rendering in simulation can become quite slow, which becomes restrictive in the amount of data that we can collect. So what do we do? So what we do over here is to exploit the fact that in simulation, you can play God. Right? In simulation, you have access to the physical parameters that you need to perform this manipulation task. For example, you know what the current pose of the object is, you know what the object velocity are, are, the kind of things you would hope that you can extract from this point cloud in the first place, right? And then we know a host of other things also, right? Fingertip velocities, fingertip positions, you know, so on and so forth. And now the other thing is also that this state space is lower dimensional because I'm no longer dealing with, you know, raw observations coming from a camera. So if we were to train the policy working from this privileged state, and the reason I call it privileged is 
One, this is available in simulation, but it's not directly available in the real world because I can, there is no sensor which is going to give me the current pose. A sensor can give me a point or an image, but not pose. Right? And second, you know, the state space is lower dimensional. Right? So if we train a policy with this, you know, using some reward function, this is going to be much easier to train, you know, both intuitively and empirically. But the challenge you run into is that you cannot deploy it. Okay. So first, what we're going to do is to say, well, let's train this policy using reinforcement learning, and then we'll worry about how to get to a deployable policy. To provide more details, you know, we have the goalposts, the current configuration. You know, I talked about what the state space is. We are learning this entity pi of theta. And the action space we're going to use for now is the change in joint position, right? So if I have my joints at some angles, I know the change. I can multiply it by some discretization of time to get the desired joints at next time step. Right? The rewards we're going to use as a difference between the goal pose and the object's current pose. Uh, there are some more reward terms that I will talk up, you know, talk later, but largely this is the reward term that we want to optimize. And we're going to train a single policy to work on, you know, hundreds of different of objects of different shapes. Right? So one policy to work across these objects. And we're going to train this using off-the-shelf reinforcement learning algorithms, you know, such as PPO. Now, the other thing we are going to do in the simulation, uh, and this is really to make sure that we are able to, you know, train a policy under different conditions. For example, you know, we want the policy to work under different mass of objects. You know, we want the policy to work under different frictions of, of the object or different kinds of sensory noise. So in the simulation, we are going to randomize these parameters. Right. So we're going to add noise to our state space. We are going to change, you know, the mass even of my robotic system. We're going to change the friction. We're going to randomize the object scale in the hope that we're going to get more generalization. And also the second hope is that, you know, in the real world, I could tell you the friction is 0.5 of a particular object. But in simulation, I don't know how to set, you know, that value because the simulation friction model could be slightly different from reality. So to account for that, instead of training on just one value of the parameter, it's nicer to train on a range. Right? So we're going to train this one policy with you know, all of this you know, dynamics randomization and also across many different shapes. And this policy is what we're going to call the teacher policy. Right? And suppose we have trained it. Now, given this teacher policy, it actually becomes, you know, much easier to train the policy on the bottom, which is, uh, and the reason is because now we can perform supervised learning. Uh, so in simulation, I can compute this state space and the state space below simultaneously, right? And then I can ask the teacher policy to give me an action and use this as supervision to train the second policy. So now this pi theta only needs to learn the mapping between observations to actions. It doesn't need to figure out what the right actions are going to be. So it doesn't need to explore, so as to say. And therefore, you know, solving this problem becomes much easier. And so we are going to do supervised learning to make this policy deployable. And this is what we're going to call the student policy. But even in the physics example, don't you actually have an optimization problem in deciding the sequence of actions? In the physics? So we are training this. The first one we are training with reinforcement learning. Okay. And, and there is a problem in deciding a sequence of actions, but your state space is much smaller. So therefore, the learning problem is much easier. Mm -hmm. And you're providing it with, you know, privileged, for example, you're providing it with good features. In the second problem on the bottom, you have to simultaneously figure out what the features are and what the good actions are. 
right? So you're kind of breaking the problem to say, well, you know, let me assume that we have some good features, you know, can I solve for exploration? And now given that I know how to explore, can I distill that into something which can work from raw observations? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Any other questions at this point? No, okay. So then we're going to take the student policy and this is what you know we are going to be uh, deploying. And just to orient everyone, you know, we have this camera, we take the point cloud, we get the joint positions, and we're going to output, you know, joint commands, have the side view of the system. And all the videos I'm going to be showing you are really doing evaluation on new object shapes. So let's look at the first example, right? So you see the camera looking at the system, and here is the goal orientation in which we want to configure this object. So what you find is the hand, you know, takes the object in the right position, but then it also, you know, moves along to show that the object is held stably. You know, here's another example where the goal is to go in the orientation on the top right. And what you see is the hand is, you know, reorienting the object. It's making and breaking contact, you know, all the time. So what these videos are showing is that we can, you know, generalize to, you know, new shapes. Now, what you might notice is all of these objects are uniformly colored and you might be wondering, well, was there a reason we chose that and would it work if the objects are more textured? Well, in this case, it doesn't matter because we are only using depth. We are not using RGB. So you could put in textured objects, you know, that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, there are existing issues with the system in the sense that it is not as precise in reorienting as we would like it to be. There many times it drops the object, but the main takeaway for us is that we are coming to a situation where we can take arbitrary shapes and be able to reorient them, which can hopefully open up the doors for doing tool use. So, the other key takeaway I want you to take back is that training in simulation and then transferring to reality, you know, can be a par powerful paradigm for solving contact rich tasks, you know, for example, the one I showed you. Okay. And the other things, you know, which really made the system work, you know, beyond using privileged information is, you know, some uh, things which are necessary to build a system. For example, we had to speed up, you know, point cloud-based training, which was initially taking 20 days to go up to four days. <clears throat> you know, then we wanted the controller to run at 12 hertz. So because of that, we couldn't use, you know, normal CNNs. So we were using sparse CNNs, which exploit the fact that in a point cloud, most of the space is empty and therefore computation can be done much faster. And the other thing which was quite important is, you know, what people call real to sim to real, uh, where you have your real world uh, robot, but there are many things about the motor which are not modeled in the simulation. For example, what is the lag? You know, what is the friction? And even the motor dynamics can be non-linear at extremities. So what we end up doing is system identification where we find the parameters in simulation which best approximate uh, the real world system, right? And this is quite important to get, you know, sim to real to work. So essentially you can think of that you, you know, do an impulse response in simulation an impulse response in reality, and then you want to match it. And then there are other things, you know, which I'll hopefully get time to talk about, which is adding additional reward terms to make optimization be easier. And some hardware considerations, you know, concerned with how do we choose the fingertip material, you know, that it has the right amount of roughness, but it's also not rigid, but has some compliance. So there are some considerations which get into choosing these fingertips. Okay. Also, what are the, uh, you know, yeah. how much error can you tolerate in the difference between your simulation and the real world? 
Yeah, I think that's an excellent question in how much error can we tolerate? Because the one, so it's really hard to measure it precisely. I think I can uh, tell you in different ways, right? For example, if you take objects in the training set and then you go from sim to real, you know, the loss in performance you get in how close you get to the goal pose, you know, might be on the range of, you know, five to 10 degrees, right? If you take new shapes at this point, that loss in performance, you know, increases to around 20 to 25 degrees. So we can characterize, you know, those kind of things, but then it's not a true comparison because I don't know uh, if I am modeling things like friction accurately in the simulator when I'm doing this comparison, right? So that is mostly an upper bound in some ways, instead of it being a lower bound. Uh, ideally, what one would do is to ablate each thing separately to say, oh, if I only have friction, which is different, what would happen? You know, if I only had shape, which is different, what would happen? You know, unfortunately, that's the kind of thing which we are unable to do at this point. And so there's another question here on Zoom. Uh, how dependent is this upon camera placement? Yeah, so I think it depends. Uh, the current version I showed you, if you only train with one camera viewpoint, it will become dependent on the camera position. If you were to randomize the camera placements, then it would be less dependent on the camera viewpoint. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, you know, let's move ahead. So as I said, you know, reorientation is just a building block and we really want to use this reorientation for doing, you know, more interesting manipulation tasks, right? So here's an example where we want to have this robotic system of peel vegetables, right? So here's the hand, you know, trying to reorient this vegetable over here. And this reorientation is coming from a trained policy, again, in simulation, and then you have the second hand which comes and peels the object. The peeling right now, someone is teleoperating it, but the hope is, you know, we can automate this uh, in the future, right? And you can also, you know, take it to other vegetables just to say that, you know, it's not overfitting to one uh, particular vegetable. Uh, and you know what would be really exciting in the future is if we can go to things like ginger and you know be able to rotate them and then have this hand peel them. So the there's, other another, there's, there's another question on Zoom. Does training the uh, teacher policy on a variety of physical parameters mm -hmm. reduce its ability to guide real world, guide the real world model? So that's an excellent question, and I will come back to it in context of locomotion. So let, let us hold off to that and revisit that in a bit. The, the short answer is yes, if you do it naively, but no, if you do it in the right way. And I'll, I'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, uh, the other, other point I want to make is, right, so uh, like over here, what you see is in the reorientation, is something we have been able to train in simulation. But peeling is something which can be quite hard to actually simulate, at least now. So what this work also does is combining the best of, you know, what you can do in simulation and for what you might require, you know, some real world data or, you know, writing controllers, you know, for doing things which we can't, you know, simulate yet. Right. So it's not that you have to do one or the other. You can also uh, potentially combine them in scenarios where simulation uh, might be hard today. Right. Then the next thing, uh, you know, which I'm going to address is, you know, how could we improve the performance of the system further? Right. So precisely this problem of not dropping objects and how do we improve precision from being 25 degrees off to getting you know, more precise to do to use things. So the one reason why these things are less precise and the objects are dropping, you might say, hey, you know, we can train better algorithms and that is going to fix it. 
right? The other reason to also think about is, you know, this system is only sensing the world through a camera. You know, it doesn't even have a sense of touch. So if the object is falling down, you know, you don't even know when it is slipping out of your hand. So, you know, there are considerations which go beyond just building good control algorithms. You know, for example, could we give these robots a sense of touch? Right. So what we did last year was to put out this touch simulator where you can see, you know, touch sensing being simulated. And, you know, in preliminary work, we showed that you can train policies with touch in simulation on this problem of fitting in this object in a hole and then transferring them into reality to again place this object back. Right. And you know, this is doing sim to real in the space of tactile. And the sensor that you see over here is called the gel site sensor. So what's a gel site sensor? It's pretty much a camera around which you put gel. And as this gel hits an object, the gel deforms, and that is something you are able to measure. So now, once we were getting some success with tactile sim to real, you know, we can put the same gel site sensors on this, you know, three finger or four finger hand and ask the question, could we improve reorientation with touch? But also ask other questions about, you know, let's imagine that you're picking up items from a grocery bag. You can't really see those items, but you can take your hand, explore them and grab those objects from a bag. Could we potentially do that? Right. So, you know, we set up a simpler version of the second problem, you know, mostly as an investigation into how good these touch sensors are and how much we can use them. So what you see is this hand is touching this object with its three touch sensors to form a tactile representation. Then we close off light and the hand has to find this target object. So imagine when you wake up in the morning, it's dark and you still want to find the phone on your bedside table. You know, you move your hand around, you know, trying to find the phone. And this is essentially what the system is doing. You know, it, you know, tries to move around you know, then figures out where the objects are, then goes ahead and, you know, touches these objects uh, to form their representations, you know, compares that and finally goes ahead and grabs the object, the intended object. So what this is telling us is that these tactile sensors are, you know, good to use and we can potentially start using them for more dynamic manipulation, you know, something we are still investigating. Uh, then the other thing we are also looking at is, you know, how can we put that, you know, touch sensors not just at the fingertips, but hopefully on the full skin, right? So I'm showing you these four different designs, and this is work in collaboration with Wojcik Matusek, where these blue things are actually gloves, which have tactile sensors on them. So think about, you know, wires crisscrossing with each other. And if you get force on places where wires crisscross, you can detect, you know, what that force is. Right? And I think it would be really exciting to have potentially higher resolution tactile sensor on fingertips, but probably lower resolution tactile sensors provided by these gloves, you know, on the rest of the hand to enable more interesting manipulation. The other consideration you can talk about or we can discuss is, you know, how good is this hand? You know, what is this the best shape of the hand? you know, is this hand, you know, compliant enough to do manipulation? Now, what do we mean by compliant? You know, compliant, we mean that, you know, if I have, uh, you know, if I have my finger, if I apply a force, you know, if my finger moves, this is called compliant. If my finger is stiff and it doesn't move, when I apply a force, it means it's not compliant. So as humans, we keep on changing the compliance of our hand, you know, quite a lot, depending on, what task we are doing, right? So, you know, we have been looking at, you know, how do we design hands which help us perform many of the everyday living tasks um, that humans perform, right? And one of the main challenges for going into hand design is that many of the existing hands are quite large and therefore they're unable to deal with small objects. So one of the things we are trying to do is to really make these hands be smaller 
and be compliant so that we can do a greater diversity of tasks. And you know, I'm not going to talk about in detail about this effort, but the reason I want to mention this is that to tackle uh, you know, a manipulation problem, it's not just about the control. Yes, we need to build better control systems for all the reasons we discussed, but it's as much about perception and hardware and really integrating you know, these things together. And that's something which we are very excited by and pursuing right now to make, you know, to really move towards tool use. Right. So I'll pause here, you know, take any questions before we transition to the next segment of the talk. So in, uh, in terms of tactile sensors, what is the pressure sensitivity of these things? And how does that relate to the uh, object itself, the rigidity or the fragility of the object? Yeah, good question. So many of these, so there was a time when people would try to measure pressure exactly of the sensors, um, sorry, from, from the sensors. But at this point, you know, we are not really measuring the pressure directly from the sensor. Uh, what we are doing is, you know, you have some rough correlate with the pressure. The reason for this is if you try to measure, you know, pressure and these things precisely, the sensors become very expensive. And, you know, perhaps when we are doing many of these manipulation tasks, we know, don't need that precise reading. What we need is, you know, some, you know, rough correlation saying that, oh, have I, where is the touch happening? So that touch resolution, you know, it could be at the level of a couple of millimeters, you know, with the gel site, you know, it increases to be a centimeter, you know, with the glove, uh, you know, or not a centimeter, but half a centimeter with the glove that I'm showing you. Uh, the glove is almost binary at this point. You know, we can't read, you know, things, you know, in the middle with the gel site sensor, which is these fingertips, you know, you can get a much more continuous reading of how much force was applied. Okay, and I have a question here. Uh, do you have, is there anything for error recovery? I'm assuming, you know, the thing begins to fail catastrophically. How does it recover from that? Good question. So one thing is this controller is running in a closed loop fashion. So the camera is seeing that something that the object is not behaving the way it should behave or it is you know slipping out and it can recover based on that the second we do have some experiments where if the object drops down the hand would come down and pick up the object and you know start reorienting it again so those are mechanisms which exist today thank you any other questions boss okay Okay, so now what we have talked about is, you know, dexterous manipulation. Now I'm going to switch gears and, you know, talk about locomotion and whole body control. And the reason I'm going to talk about is because I stated my goal is to quickly and easily design diverse and complex behaviors that work in less structured settings. And I believe one way we can do this is if we have the same framework to design controllers for many different tasks that we are doing. So what I'm going to show you is the same framework of sim to real learning, this teacher-student policy learning, the same ideas also work in context of locomotion and whole body control, right? And therefore, you know, we might be moving closer towards, you know, our goal. Uh, so the goal that we set for ourselves specifically, you know, in context of locomotion is, you know, how do we get the agility of you know animals in the wild but also knowing that they can you know go on many many diverse terrains right and we're going to use the same framework you know that i described for manipulation to solve these problems this work was led by Gabe margolis in the lab right. so the question you can ask is you know why does agile locomotion in the wild remain challenging you know i can answer it in three different ways you know one is anticipating the future uh, most, you know, locomotion systems that you see are actually blind. You know, second is, you know, suboptimal model approximations. You know, it comes out whether you're doing more classical, you know, optimization-based methods because you have to simplify your world and you cannot deal with all the complexity. 
or in the learning world, you are going to have, you know, the simulation to reality gap. And of course, that hardware considerations. Right. So first, I'm going to talk about, you know, anticipating the future, and then slowly we'll move through other things. Right. So I'm going to start off with this uh, demo that sang by Kim's lab at MIT put out in 2012, where you had this, you know, robot jump over these obstacles. So what you see is it seems that this controller has the capability to be to be agile, but the vision system that they ended up using was you know very handcrafted, you know potentially only working for obstacles like this, right? And one of the main challenges which happens for a vision system really is that the robot is moving, the camera is moving, you know everything is very noisy, and still you need to figure out you know what commands the robot needs to apply, right? And things can become even more challenging, um, you know, if the robot, you know, there are gaps, you know, that you have to jump over and the robot could potentially fall down, you know, so on and so forth, right? So what we constructed, you know, as a case study to understand, you know, what's hard in doing perception at high speeds, right? And, you know, how, how we are positioned in building closed loop, you know, highly agile systems, are these environments that we call gap worlds, you know, where the robot still needs to, uh, you know, navigate through these different terrains, but these terrains are randomly generated. So you need to do some planning on how to place your footsteps and you, you can't do this blindly. You know, you can, you have to use, you know, some, you know, perception to address this question, right? So how would we solve this question, right? So you have a depth camera, one gets this observation, what do we do? Right. So what one could say is, well, I want to learn a policy, you know, pi theta, which is going to provide me with, you know, where should my legs, you know, contact the ground at what speed I should be running. And I can pass these actions into some low level controller, which can convert them into joint positions and velocities. And typically in robotics, you know, you run one more loop of, error recovery, which makes sure that we are following the joint position and velocities which are commanded, which is called as a PD controller, which essentially outputs your motor torques, right? So this, you know, work of converting, you know, your, you know, foot locations into motor torques, you know, exist, you know, there's, you know, a lot of work in this area, right? And what we were really interested is in focusing on the perception part, right? So, you know, what, so one way, you know, one could approach this problem is to say, well, I have a depth image, you know, what if I use this depth image to reconstruct a map of the world, you know, which in this case could be a height map, which tells me, you know, what is the height of each pixel or if everything is flat, you know, where, you know, is a gap and where is there not a gap. Right. And there are many, you know, mapping techniques out there. And then given this height map, one could perform planning. So usually this pipeline can work quite well if you're not trying to be fast. Right. But if you want to be fast, you know, doing this can become potentially a challenge. Right. And there are other considerations which, you know, we can discuss, you know, if people are interested in why this pipeline could be challenging. Right. So an alternative is a more end-to-end -end approach where we directly go from depth images to actions. And the good news might be that we can do this, you know, quite fast in terms of, you know, running the policy at 30 hertz, at 50 hertz. And second, if we have some noise in the depth image, maybe my policy will learn how to accommodate this noise. Right? And again, we can train this with a reward function you know, and train the policy using reinforcement learning. But, you know, these policies could be good for high-speed deployment, but as I, you know, discussed, or, or so, sorry, uh, so this policy can be good for deployment, but what we found is that these policies can be very hard to train, right? Again, the same observation, hard to train because you have to deal with the high dimensional observation space. And as the camera is moving, the depth images would also move a lot, you know, making it a challenging problem to learn. So we're going to use pretty much the same recipe that we saw before, where we're going to first train a policy using privileged information, right? So suppose if I already had a map, which I have access to in simulation, 
then training an adult policy will become much easier you know and the reason being because now i don't have you know these fluctuations happening because of the camera which is attached on the robot moving all the time so this policy is you know much easier to train we can do it with rl but we cannot really deploy it right? so we're going to you know for the same teacher student policy framework you know first train a policy with height map and then you know do supervised learning to train a policy which works from depth observations right? and yeah, and specifically, you know, we are going to use a variant of behavior cloning or supervised learning called Dagger. And the student policy is the one we're going to deploy. Right? So again, and the he, student policy is also on a, is it, is that also on a simulated terrain? It's also on simulated terrain, yes. So everything is in simulation over here. Yeah. Right. So now, you know, first, you know, if we see what this policy does in simulation, you see it's able to jump, you know, quite far, you know, sometimes even 1.5 times the body length. Right. Then we can try putting it in reality. And, you know, this is the kind of behavior we end up getting. Right. Uh, now we can also quantify them instead of just showing you these images, right? So on the y-axis, I'm plotting the gap crossing success rate. On the x-axis, I'm plotting how wide the gaps are. Right? So what you see is this blue line uh, is able to cross gaps which are larger than the robot's body length, which is the vertical orange line over here. The performance decreases, but it can you know, still maintain around 50% accuracy at you know, 1.5 times the body length. But if you deploy this in reality, the best you know, the longest gap we could cross back in 2021 was only 26 centimeters. And what you notice is, oh, there's this big gap, you know, happening, you know, between sim and real. Wow. You know, why? And the natural question is, you know, why is this happening? You know, could we close it in some way? Right. And what we realized is, like, in uh, what is happening is that this model that we were using, which would take the commanded velocities of the robot into motor talks was making some assumptions. You know, it was assuming uh, access to the body velocity, right? So if you think about it, the robot is moving, you don't know what its body velocity is. You know, all you can figure out is how the joints are moving. And from that, you have to compute the body velocity. But this computation of body velocity required or relied on the assumption that the foot is not slipping on the ground. You know, but if the robot is moving at high speeds, it keeps slipping all the time, right? So this was one of the primary reasons, you know, we thought that this controller is not, you know, working as well when we are deploying it in reality, right? Then you could say, oh, well, how about we change this assumption and fix it and say, well, now I can deal with slip. Well, you can do it, but it will require time. It will again require someone to, you know, sit down, think about, you know, how to compute velocity when we have slip, and then figure out how to optimize it. And the other things which will keep coming up, right? I mean, at fast speeds, motor dynamics could change. Uh, you know, you might end up, you know, hitting into limits of how much force you can apply, so on and so forth. So it seems to be, you know, that there could be many, many different corner cases which uh, keep coming. So it's really a long tail of things which one might have to model, right? And this really is, you know, an instantiation of why an approximation that was made to ease optimization was really hurting our performance, right? And then we said, well, can we go and try to fix, you know, this issue to some extent, right? So when you're trying to walk in the wild and also do fast locomotion, you're dealing with many different things, you know, variable friction, variable softness of the terrain, uneven geometry, the terrain might be sloped, when you're running fast, you're hitting actuator limits, which means that your optimization can be discontinuous. You're applying high forces. You know, if the robot is in the air, then while it is jumping, then no matter what forces it applies on its legs, it's not really going to affect its motion. And this is all those things which make the optimization problem be hard, right? Because the problem becomes non-convex, discontinuous, harder to optimize. And you know, how do people deal with this is to only model some factors of variation, right? So for example, someone might say, I'm only going to deal with variable softness and then build a model which can do optimization in that scenario. 
or deal with these two other properties or deal with these two other properties, right? And this is, you know, tying back into why this approach may not be scalable because depending on the particular scenario, you need to come in and design a controller which can work over there. And the question we can ask is, you know, can we deal with all of these complexities, you know, in a single policy? And this is what, you know, we're going to look at. And the idea is going to be quite similar, you know, train and simulation where we can emulate these many, many different scenarios and then transfer to reality. So how do we go about training this policy? And I'm hoping I can answer the question which was raised earlier of, you know, how do we deal with all this randomization which is happening? Right. So, but first let's look at the policy. So there's a question so, here. Is the yeah. privilege info fixed or is there a way to get real world information? then pre-process or transform it into privileged information and only then use it for training? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I mean, I think what you're asking is, you know, in the real world, could you construct a classifier, for example, or a regression system which can look at observations and go to privileged information? I think that is a viable approach. Typically, what it does is it makes a two-stage problem where you first go from observations to privileged information and then from privileged information to your actions. So the noise that you get in estimating privileged information, you know, can propagate in action prediction, which potentially is a challenge. So I think you can do it. it and that's but but that's the main reason why we decided not to do it that way. Okay, any other questions? So let's look at this construct. So we have some observation, you know, coming as input and we want to learn a policy, you know, which produces actions. So observations might be joint positions, joint velocity, the IMU reading. And again, we're going to use privileged information over here. So we're going to tell this agent, you know, how much is the friction, how much is the restitution, you know, so on and so forth, right? And the reason is because, okay, in reality, I don't know, right? Or I want my robot to work across many different frictions. You know, my motor strength might change over time. So I also want it to work across different amounts of motor strength, right? And then our reward function could be how fast the robot is running and we can optimize the policy for that. Right? And this is what we're going to call the teacher policy. And then we're going to have a student policy, which of course doesn't have access to this privileged information and we want to train it. Now we are going to have this variable ZT, right? And if somehow ZT becomes equal to D, you know, then, you know, this policy will behave similarly to the teacher policy, right? So you could say, you know, this is in, you know, relationship with the question which was being asked, right? Uh, that you have these observations and you know actions or a history of observations and actions, they go through this function f, which produces z, right? And you know I pass in z as uh, you know as the input to my policy. Now what I really care about is not matching z and d together, right? What I really care about is that my actions are similar, right? And therefore you know what you know, we have been doing is to put this loss at the action level, not necessarily, you know, at this level, right? And so you can train the teacher policy first and then clone it to obtain the student policy, right? And, you know, this paradigm is, you know, student teacher learning for online system identification, because you're trying to estimate from your past observations, you know, how, you know, like how the, you know, what, could be the parameters in which my agent is uh, is being evaluated, right? Uh, and this, you know, so what happens is this, you know, the, the fact that D is part of the input when you're training the teacher policy makes the system still be performant, even though we are training with a wide range of D. Right, so there could there, there is a world where you only train the policy with OT and don't put D as input. Now, if you do that, then you're asking the system to walk on many, many different terrains with many different frictions. 
Now, in that case, the policy will learn something very conservative because it could learn to walk very slowly because it has to walk on all the terrains. But because we are providing this privileged information D, the policy can decide, oh, I'm on a terrain with less friction. You know, I should walk in a different way than when I'm on terrain with high friction, right? Now, in reality, we don't have access to privileged information, but we have access to history of observations. And we use this history of observations to directly map to actions in the hope that you are implicitly learning some representation of that privileged information. Now, there are many different works, you know, which do it in different ways. So there's work from ETH, you know, there's also work from, you know, Deepak's group at CMU, which considers, you know, like there are, there are different ways to train the student policy, you know, given the teacher policy. And, you know, then just to walk through how the student policy looks like, right? So we are going to have our observations, actions, you know, go as input the policy to output actions. My observations are going to be the joint position, the joint velocity, readings from an IMU, which is my observation O. Actions are again going to be joint positions. Uh, and then we're going to give some command and the command is pretty much going to be how fast the robot has to run in X, Y, and spin. All right, so that's the framework that we are going to be using. Uh, I'll, I'll take a small pause and see if there's anyone has questions or comments over here. So any questions over here? Okay, nothing just yet, continue. Okay. The, the, the one thing that we do end up running into an issue over here is, you know, I'm showing you the commands which are of rotating the robot and Vx is how fast you're moving in the x direction. So when we are training, you know, we need to train with, you know, some commands that we are sampling. So if you sample commands, which are, you know, small, which means that you're asking the robot to walk slowly, everything works out perfectly well, right? But as we try to increase this sampling range, which means that I really want my robot to walk very fast or run very fast, you know, things don't work out as well, right? So what I'm showing you is, you know, this curve, which Y axis is some measure of performance, you know, X axis, you know, so just think about this, the higher this line is, the better the performance is. And if I sample my commands throughout a, a wide range of, you know, spinning and sprinting, the performance is quite bad. And the reason, you know, this happens is because there is physics in what the robot can do and cannot do. You know, for example, at high uh, linear, you cannot both run fast and spin fast. You know, that's just not possible to do because of centrifugal forces and the physics which is there, right? So if you sample commands, you know, just uniformly, things are not going to work because most of the time you'll sample infeasible commands. You know, instead, what you want to do is to learn a way to sample commands which is not uniform, but respects the boundary of physics, right? And this is something, you know, quite critical to do to achieve good performance because otherwise, if you tell the robot to do infeasible things, most of the times, the learning isn't going to work, right? So I'm not going to go into details of how we exactly do this, but this is something I want you to be aware of, and the details are there in the paper. And if you do it, the performance can be, you know, much better. So I have a question here. Yeah. Uh, in the real world, our environment can be very dynamic with surprises. So how can we accurately estimate the privileged information which seems necessary for our policy requires estimation of privileged information? So, so there are different, so there are different kinds of things which can be dynamic, right? So I think there are people in the world which could be there, right? Someone could apply a force on the robot, right? Or the terrain properties could be changing, right? So think about, you know, if you are applying a force on the robot, like someone kicks the robot. Now in simulation, we can emulate, you know, the robot being applied many different random forces, 
you know, and that is how the robot can be robust to those things. You know, when it comes down to, you know, friction and, uh, you know, these other properties, empirically, what one has found is that if you have an observation history, which is less than a second, you know, that is sufficient to estimate these properties. Now, of course, if the task is super dynamic, where things, you know, your action time is less than a second, you know, then that could be more problematic. And over there, you would have to perceive the environment in front of you a priori instead of doing this online system identification. So there is a limit, but that limit you don't run into quite a lot or, or, or you really run into that limit in very complex, even in very complex real world scenes. Did I answer your question? Apparently, yes. Okay. Uh, how do you go about picking picking privileged information? Uh, As, yeah. Why is friction picked above some metric for ground softness? So, okay, that's a great question. I think this is one of the dirty laundries of, you know, doing <laughs> this design where you have to pick up these parameters. And I think that's really the frontier at this point that how can we automate picking up of these parameters? So I don't have a nice answer. I have a dirty answer. But, you know, if I have time, maybe I can talk about how we are trying to go towards a nice answer in maybe the last five minutes of my talk. Thank you. Right. So, you know, once you, you know, deploy these systems, you know, this is what you end up getting, you know, over here, you know, we got the higher speed on this platform. You know, you can take it on these challenging terrains, you know, for example, you know, spinning on ice over here. Right. Here's another example, you know, where you can put oil and the system will, you know, adapt to, you know, different, you know, properties. You know, here is where we're comparing, you know, against a baseline controller on trying to go up, you know, this gravelly hill. So what you find is the system is not, you know, perhaps behaving in the most eloquent way, but it's getting, you know, the job done over here. Right. Here's another example where one of the screws in the motor, uh, you know, became loose. And then what you find is the robot is still walking, but it starts to limp. And the reason this is happening is there's no magic, right? The reason why it is it can still function is because in simulation, we varied the motor strength. So now if it encounters a different motor strength, it's still able to, you know, function, you know, quite well. You know, once you're able to, you know, make the robot walk, you can go to a more complex scenario where you say, well, let's kick a soccer ball because now you need to balance yourself on three legs and then use the fourth leg to apply a force on the ball, you know, more challenging problem than still, than just doing locomotion. You know, sometimes the system can fall down and it can recover and still continue, you know, dribbling the ball. You know, we can make the life be quite challenging, uh, especially in winters. It's an amazing time to test these controllers uh, because you have to deal with, you know, slip and unevenness, which, you know, snow provides in a very interesting way. So now that, you know, we can start doing control with, you know, three legs and using one leg as a manipulator, you know, why not put the manipulator on the robot? So over here, you know, Tiffany is teleoperating this robot over here. And we have trained the policy in a way that the robot is using its whole body to, you know, extend its reach to different points. Now, I think this is something that, you know, previous works have also demonstrated to do this whole body control. Uh, the one thing that we were quite excited by is could we modulate forces also? So for example, over here, you know, Gabe is pulling this robot, but what you see is the robot is really using its hips to increase the force, which it cannot do, you know, by its hand. And, and yeah. And then here's an example where because we can do, you know, force control, it becomes quite easy for us to not even provide demonstrations because this arm is compensating for gravity naturally. So with just two fingers, you know, the game can move the system, provide a demo, and the system complies to what we have provided. Right. 
right? So what I've shown you is, you know, some ways in which, you know, seem to real can be applied and pretty much our code base that we use for manipulation and whatever I presented for locomotion is quite similar. Uh, so in, in that way, we really have the same framework to design controllers, both for manipulation and locomotion, uh, which is pretty exciting in my opinion. Right. So, you know, I told you I'm going to talk about the dirty laundry and this is where I get into the dirty laundry. But before I get into that, I'll take a pause and see if someone has a question. Uh, here's one. Uh, if you, is there any explainability to the policies it learns? Um, not yet. It also depends on what you mean by explainability. Um, so if you want to do you know, like psychology or cognitive science in the same way you would do to a human, you can do it. You know, some people look at, you know, categorizing where the policy will work and where the policy will not work. I think we can do, definitely we could do some kind of quantification of on these kind of terrains, you can expect this kind of performance. So depending on what you want, the answer is yes or a no. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, let's look at this reward design problem, right? And what is the reward design problem? The problem is that when we were asking this robot to perform rapid locomotion, we were not just giving it X and Y velocity and the spin velocity, you're we giving it more terms, right? And we add some of these other terms like your Z velocity or your role should be constrained you should not have self-collision, right? See, all these coefficients are negative, which means you should not do these things, right? So one reason we say is stability, but really the other reason is that we want the sim, we want the optimization to become easier because putting these terms restricts the space of motions the robot can actually explore, right? And the other things, you know, that one adds that your joint torque should be small, acceleration should be small, and these things, you know, one way to think about them, we are adding them for smoothness, but really other way to think about them is we are adding them so we can close the sim to real gap, right? Because if the robot is applying, you know, very high torques or is, you know, jittering, you know, we know those things don't transfer well. We know that smooth things have a higher chance of transferring. So we are building in some of the prior knowledge about what is a good behavior through this reward function, right? And the goal is, you know, could we just work with the task reward? And that's all I want to tell the robot. And can it automatically learn the behaviors that I want? Right. So in the recent, you know, I think maybe three months or six months, you know, there's a lot of excitement in the field about how we could use language models or LLMs for designing these reward functions automatically. You know, if you're interested, you know, I encourage you to check out, you know, those works, but I'm going to provide you with a slightly different perspective, which is not, you know, reliant on these large models. So let's look at the reward function that we have. There are two things over here, right? So one is the reward coefficients, which someone has set meticulously, and other is these reward terms. So first, you know, I'm going to discuss about how we can simplify you know, learn, uh, you know, how can we remove the need for us to manually specify reward coefficients and then talk about some ongoing work we have and how do we automate, you know, these reward terms. And both of these works are really in progress at this point in time, right? So let's consider a simple setup where we just have to trade off between two terms, you know, so one term is task performance, which is say the speed, e pi is the energy, right? And we want to trade off between task and energy and we have some coefficient lambda. So we can plot it, you know, how the objective function looks like, right? So if we, what we want is to get high task performance and at low energy consumption, which is the bottom right. Now different choices of lambda, you know, lead to different solutions on this spectrum. Now what one is typically interested in is what is called the Pareto optimal front, which means that if I choose a point over here, then it means that for this particular task performance, you know, I cannot, you know, you know, I cannot go lower in energy. The energy has to be at least this much, 
right? And these points are called Pareto optimal. So how do we find a point like this, which is really, you know, trying to be very agile, but also consuming less energy when I don't want to set this by hand or do a hyperparameter search to figure lambda, could we devise, you know, a more principled way to find this parameter, right? So the goal really is to maximize performance, right? And if you are at a particular performance number, there's a band of energy that your controller could occupy. And what you want to do is to drive down the energy as much as possible. So you want to go as much as possible on the right and as much, you know, on the bottom as possible. So we can, you know, realize this intuition. So the way we do it is to say, let's train one policy pi, which is only going to minimize energy, right? And let's train another policy pi prime, whose goal is to only maximize speed, right? And then we're going to couple these policies so that they end up competing with each other, right? And we're going to do this coupling by putting in a constraint, right? So J is just measuring the speed. Right, so what this constraint reads is, if I get, if I compute the speed of the policy pi, which is only minimizing energy, it should be higher, you know, than the speed of the policy, which is only optimizing speed, right? So you are trying to increase the speed over here, right, as much as possible, and you're trying to minimize energy, but you want the blue policy to always be above the purple policy. Right or, or always be on the right of the you know of the purple policy right which is this constraint is imposing. Now, if you have this constraint, you know there is you know if you have a constraint optimization problem, you can take the constraint, put it onto the optimization problem, and you get this you know dual value that you can optimize or the Lagrangian that you can optimize. So it turns out, you know, optimizing that Lagrangian, you know, gives you a closed form solution into how one can update this value lambda. Right? So, you know, we can do that. And what we find is, you know, policies like this, for example, this robot is spinning and this robot is only trained with the reward function, which is the task reward and the energy reward and no other, you know, reward tuning that we have done. Right, so it's another example of it, you know, running and spinning, right, as a step towards, you know, moving towards that goal of finding this lambda without doing, um, you know, reward tuning, oh, sorry, without doing hyperparameter tuning. Now, this problem happens in many different places. For example, when we are trying to learn from rewards and trying to learn from, you know, demonstrations, which is, can I learn from RL and supervised learning? then the question becomes, how do we find this balance, right? So again, we can use a similar philosophy where we have one policy, you know, which is optimizing my reward function plus lambda times supervision coming from a teacher. This is what I call as pi RL plus IL, right? And the key idea in deciding when to use the teacher is to say the teacher should only be used when it is helpful. Right. Now, what does it mean by when it is helpful? Right. So to figure out what is helpful, you know, we can train a counterfactual policy. Now, this counterfactual policy is only trained with rewards. It has no guidance from the teacher at all. Right. So what we can now do is to impose the constraint that we should only use the teacher if the policy with the teacher performs better than the counterfactual policy, which doesn't have the teacher. Right. So again, this ends up being this constraint, which says the policy which teacher has to perform better than the policy without the teacher. Right? And again, if you write the dual version of it, you get a Lagrange multiplier, you know, and if you opt and if you write down the update rule for that, you will get an update rule of how to modify this parameter. Right. And this is work done by Dan and Zhang Wei. Right. And intuitively, how it looks like is, you know, we are collecting data. And from this data, we are training two policies, you know, one with RL plus alpha IL, which is, you know, RL plus imitation learning, one only with RL. We compare the performance of both these policies. And if the policy with the teacher is doing better, we go and increase the magnitude of teacher's importance. 
right? The other place this question comes in is when we're trying to balance exploration versus exploitation in reinforcement learning. And the question is, how do we find this balance? You know, turns out we can use a similar approach of constructing two policies and, you know, coupling them through a constraint. And this leads to a way of balancing exploration and exploitation still approximately, but doing it, you know, substantially better than previous attempts. And, you know, we can, you know, compare this with, you know, off the shelf methods that exist today. Right. So, for example, you know, I'm going to compare against PPO, you know, that we have been using until now. You know, IPO is our version of doing reinforcement learning, but with, you know, much better exploration. And we're comparing against some of the past work in exploration, which is PPO plus R&D. And what I'm showing you are these numbers, which measure whether a method A is performing better than method B when we evaluate over many environments. So suppose we evaluate over 100 environments and you want to ask in which environment does method A outperform method B, right? And that is a measure of how good a particular algorithm is when applied to a new problem, right? So what we find is that, you know, these many past attempts at doing better exploration, which is consistent with, you know, some other prior work is that they don't really improve over PPO on average, right? Versus, you know, the method that we have now, this IPO plus R&D is able to explore, you know, better and it's better on 64% of the games. And, you know, if we compare against people with R&D, so I mean, these numbers, 4% is within error bars, right? So the point being, you know, if you were using PPO today to do your optimization, you might as well consider using this better way of doing exploration. And this is one of the crux of how we are trying to potentially remove some of these reward terms by saying that many of these reward terms have been put into ease optimization, but maybe if we can do better exploration, we can mitigate, you know, the need for, uh, you know, putting in these reward terms, right? And, you know, I'll end by, you know, outlining a possible future, right, where a human might say, you know, train me a controller for dribbling a soccer ball on diverse natural terrains. And maybe this is actually said in natural language, right? And then we have a machine, like we have a machine learning system which design environments, you know, designs the reward functions for us. You know, then we have the performance of the agent in simulation. You know, some system could look at that performance, right? It could be a vision language model. It could be, you know, something else. And based on that, we, uh, you know, redesign or modify the reward of the environment, something which a human does now, but potentially could also be automated, right? And similarly, once you deploy the policy, you might find it's not behaving as well. And you, again, might want to modify the environment and the rewards so that we can improve, you know, same to real performance. So I think in summary, you know, training in simulation is a viable way of collecting large amounts of data, which is helping us train robust policies. But there is this dirty laundry of designing environments and rewards, which needs to be done on a case by case basis. And if we can crack how to automate this or make it less tedious, I think we can really unlock, you know, this vision or this dream of generating many different behaviors very quickly. You know, with that, I'll stop and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, that was brilliant. And I must confess, the last 10 minutes pretty much answered all the questions I had. In that, right. How do you design the rewards? How do you choose the uh, simulation? And uh, some, some still seem to be open questions. Uh, students, do you guys have any questions? Anything is very cool. So any questions, folks? So I don't see any questions. It's sort of leaving there on to the next class. But thank you so much, Pulkit. It was brilliant, right? Very, very nice. And, thank you, Diksha, uh, for having me. And yeah, we should catch up sometime. Yes, we, we should. I'll give you a call one of these days. Okay. And lots of students thanking you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.
And if you have any follow up questions, you know, feel free to shoot me an email, and we can go from there. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Right. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.